Um, this is live stream number 20. I am Brandon Sanderson, your author for the evening. I am going to be signing copies of The Way of Kings, which you're going to be seeing me do a lot in the future because I have to sign 15,000 of these uh, for the Kickstarter that we are, I don't have to, I'm super excited to, that you all bought plenty of copies of this, but yeah, they bought uh, two and a half times what we thought they would, um, or we thought at our best estimates, and so that means lots of signing to be done. Uh, we have a uh, special guest star, Isaac Stewart. Hello. Uh, for those unaware, Isaac is the art director at uh, my company. Uh, he is the person who did the maps for most of my books, going back to Mistborn and does the symbols for most of my books, and does some other things, like some of Navani's sketchbook pages were Isaac, and um, a lot of the icons that are in the Stormlight Archive are Isaac, and he art directs everything else. So anything that's made for one of my books, cover art, interior art, or whatever, goes through Isaac. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> which, which means that we get to do things like have... Um, um, even better artists start doing Navani sketchbook pages so, <laughs> to make them a little more consistent. There and... are no better artists than you. Artists just have different focuses. Yeah, Your I, I talents should say. Are, are very, every artist has individual talents, and you are really, really, really good at maps. Well, thank there you. is nobody who does fantasy maps who is better than you. Um, and you're also very good at picture books. Evidently, yes. <laughs> um, I, I should say then that uh, somebody th whose style was uh, a little more appropriate for Navani's sketchbook pages, um, and that's Kelly Harris. She does amazing work for us. And and, and we're stretching out. More people are doing the uh, icons in the Stormlight yeah. books a little mm -hmm. bit more, having a, a little bit more diversity of style, but sometimes I'm still designing those. But yeah. ben, ben is starting to design those a bit more now too. And uh, yeah. yeah. We, we, we just have more people with more hands and everything, and I guess that's what an art director is supposed to do. So it's happened to our business all along, right? <laughs> like, uh, it started off as Brandon in his basement writing books, and now um, it's all of us in a, a company's basement sitting on streams and doing things. So... We have quite the quite the team these days. Yeah, it keeps getting bigger. I never, I, I don't know if I, I never expected this, but I don't, I never knew any authors, uh, at least back in the day, that that did it quite like this. We have we have an entrepreneurial mindset over here. Yeah. Um, other authors we know that do kind of this. I guess Kevin J. Anderson does Kevin a little does bit a of this. Kevin does a bunch of things like yeah. this. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, regardless, we are going to be taking your questions tonight um, and chatting about various random things here and there. Um, I've told the story, I assume, on stream about how you set me up with Emily. I think you have, yeah. yeah. Isaac was set me up on a blind date. Uh, I believe the thing that you said is, this is uh, someone I would ask out uh, in different circumstances. <laughs> uh, she was taller than you. Yes, I think I was concerned about yeah. the height, but mm -hmm. I thought she was really cool. Mm -hmm. She set me up that night too. I had a yes. blind date. You had a that blind night, date, and we went. You and didn't saw... do a second blind date. I sh I, I got married, so you did yeah. a better job than 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 we did. But we went to a Pirates of Pinafore. What's that? Pirates of Penzance. Yeah, or Pirates HMS of Pinafore. Pinafore. It was one of the two. Oh, uh, yeah, it was one of the two. Now I can't remember because they're both. Yeah, they're basically yeah. They're, they're both they're... nautical. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, I do remember that she was a, a, a nice, a nice woman that, that Emily set up with me, and I remember she had a very fuzzy sweater that I thought was pretty cool. That was at the Sarah Shell, yeah, where we saw that. Uh, for any who, anyone who knows the Provo Orem area. Did we have Indian food that night? <sighs> no, uh, because it was we went no, to. No, it was an Italian, Italian restaurant place that is now closed that became an Indian restaurant. That's why I was thinking yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. We did not have good luck. The The first, like, three places that Emily and I went on dates all closed. So, uh, <laughs> maybe the, the, the curse of, uh, of whatever. Um, our second date was uh, she and I went to see uh, The Pride and Prejudice with Kiera Knightley. Mm. But being Utah, 
it was sold out except for the front row. Oh. So we uh, sat and looked up Mr. Darcy's nose for the entire day. <laughs> and they didn't charge you extra for that? <laughs> um, let's take a question. Okay. See what people are asking us. I assume because there's been no panic motions from Adam that everyone can hear us. Now. Well, you know, I'm always in a state of constant panic mm. uh, during these streams, but I'm trying to, uh, to make do. Mm. So uh, this question from Mark says, what will you do when Isaac inadvertently, I'll uh, put that mm -hmm. in quotations, becomes a, su a successful and world-renowned full-time children flap book writer designer and doesn't have time to be your art designer anymore that or art director? That would be a really tragic event. Um, and I don't know what we would do. I don't, I don't know how much Isaac would like being full-time lift the flap. Yeah, creator. I'm, I, I should probably say that my first love is epic fantasy and I accidentally wrote a children's book. It took 10 months of accidentally doing this or something like that, right? Uh, See, that's your accidentally is because you have to do the art. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, Where you just accidentally write a novella to novel mm -hmm. twice the length that you were anticipating it to be. Yes, but <laughs> that, does, that doesn't take 10 months. Because that's true. Art that's true. takes... Oh, took you long. about two, three hours does, to double the length. Not take two or three hours. <laughs> no, I, I, I uh, have ideas for other uh, picture books, but I have other things that I want to do with my life too. Mm -hmm. Other things I want to try, and um, so we'll see how this children's book does. But uh, it's the trouble of being a Renaissance man, Isaac. Yeah. See, I am very specialized. I do one thing, and uh, I've been lucky that I just kind of honed in on that early in my life. Um, a lot of my friends, like you, like you're a musician, you're a writer, and you're an illustrator. And, and I, I, I look at you and I go, wow, I wish I had focused. Because, mm -hmm. because it's, it, it kind of tears your mind into different pieces, right? It's not the shattering of Aiden Alzium, it's the shattering of Isaac. That doesn't sound quite as good. But. You cannot contain your genius. I have heard your music, and I don't think your music could be contained in illustrations or books. It needed to be sung. We should yep. totally bring a song or two to yeah. a live you know, stream sometime and uh, do a clip. Just how about we just make fun. it the official intro music to these live streams? <laughs> we what was the name of your band again? Let, I'll give you some uh, uh, some uh, music, and you can listen and simple. find something, right? <laughs> Um, we had I had a band called Control Z with uh, Nigel Style on drums, and he's he's amazing. He's an artist. He he uh, works in animation and video games, um, and, and he's a good friend. But Nigel Style was on drums, and uh, I was on the guitar and bass, and and lead, sing lead, and vocals. lead singer le yeah. lead vocals. Uh, Nigel did background vocals, and then I had other songs that I that I did to went to uh, on the acoustic guitar. Um, We'll play some one sometime. That'd be super fun. Because I just got a really cool electric guitar. The electric guitar that I had before was this crappy thing I bought from an old roommate's old roommate for like 50 bucks. And that's what I recorded all these albums with. Um, and now I have a really nice guitar that sounds awesome. And it makes me want to play it all the time. My son is learning the trombone. Ooh. Yes, Joel. That's the instrument he picked. Um, so it's what it's, I played. It's not you did. I did. Did he yeah. know that? Did I have no idea. Chat with him. You need to, like, it's nice having the Cosmere House, which is our our business, which is next door, because he can come over here and play <laughs> to practice, <laughs> and then you have to deal with it, yeah. and I don't have to. So uh, what was his thought process about choosing an instrument and landing I'm not on trombone? Sure. Um, like he just said. They, they have the bands come in and everyone play the instruments, and he just liked it. He liked the sound of it. Mm -hmm. um, and Emily and I both did a uh, marching band when we were in high school. I was an, a trumpeter and she was a, a flutist. And uh, we both like marching band, thought it was good for our just learning to do something and becoming good at it and having a, a friend group and a social group. Mm -hmm. Just it was good for both of us. And so uh, when he said he was in thinking of it, we encouraged him. Um, and uh, he picked trombone, so, you know. Um, so why did you pick trumpet? I picked trumpet because I, I first uh, wanted to do cello, and my hmm. parents looked at how much a cello cost and said, can you pick something else? <laughs> and so I said, well, um, I, like, uh, I like jazz music even still. 
Um, I like jazz trumpet. Um, if I wasn't going to be playing cello in an orchestra, um, what else would I want to play? And uh, I liked I liked playing the melody. Um, I didn't want to be you know rhythm section or something like that. So trumpet, it's it's odd you know go from cello, which is more of a you know background instrument. But I really like the sound of the cello. The cello sounds so Just awesome. So pretty. Um, and uh, it was actually, I think, a good move because, as I said, band was a really good social group for me growing mm -hmm. up. And there are no cellists in marching band. And sure, I could have been in concert band, but it wasn't the same camaraderie that yeah. marching band was. And so I ended up really liking being a trumpeter. I did not continue it after my first year of college. Um, basically, by then, I had found my passion in writing, and I knew I, I needed, I could really only have one all-consuming artistic passion. Um, plus, I served a mission for two years in Korea, and uh, you know that was two years away from the trumpet. And I could have picked it back up, but I'll tell you, high school it was a great um, friend group, a great social group. It was nice, you know. You went to competitions and stuff like that. I went to college, and in college, uh, number one, marching band is way harder, way, 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 way harder. Um, I don't know if you you know this, but like in high school, you would learn one show over the course of the semester, get better and better and better at it, um, and then eventually perform it for you know contests and stuff. In college, you learn a new show each week for each different uh, football game. There are no contests, just the football game, which is the you know there's a lot of eyes on you. You have to be really good, and you have to memorize that thing quickly, and you have to work really hard. And after one semester of that, which was half credit hour, that took, Ooh. it was like three or four hours most evenings um, for a half credit and just like exhausting work, I realized band in college is for people who really like music. And I like listening to music, but playing music was always more of a social thing for me, right? I enjoyed learning music theory and playing, but at the end of the day, it was a thing to do. And um, I just said, you know what, I'm done. Uh, and so put the trumpet away, focused on my writing, and uh, haven't really ever regretted it. You know, a lot of people I know are like, oh, I wish I'd kept up the piano or something. The trumpet did exactly what I needed it to in my life, and I'm very grateful for it. But I do not miss, you know, keeping up that skill. I played trumpet as well in high school, but it was because we had a trumpet. Oh, okay, yeah. But it turns out that I really liked it for similar reasons. Um, and it, it turned out really great when I was in jazz band and I was the only male trumpeter. Huh? Which was, was really awesome because we had all of the, the female trumpeters that kind of took care of me. Huh? I actually night, proved nice to ladies, be... So. I, I, it becomes a story I talk about uh, a lot because uh, I was really frustrated by jazz band. Because even though I really like jazz, I couldn't figure out how to improv. Granted, it's a skill that probably takes a while, and I just did it for one year. Um, but I just could not get it to click. Um, I would hear the music in my head and could not make it come out the front of the horn. And whatever reason, it just, I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't figure out how people did it. Um, when it came time for my solos in the jazz band, I basically made up a solo and played it every time, uh, which sounded just fine for people. But the, the, uh, the teacher was always like, you know, this isn't the soul of jazz. You need to learn to improv and go with the music. And I'm like, I know, but I don't know how. How do you do it? He's like, just feel it and do it. And I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't work. Uh, I can feel it. It doesn't do. Uh, and then he said, you know, you now need to practice your scales a little bit more and things like that. And I think the real answer is I was just not dedicated to the trumpet enough to learn that. But I always talk about writing where um, I feel like a lot of writers have this in their head, this, this book they imagine being perfect and they have trouble making it come out on the page. And when you're newer, sometimes you don't even realize it's not coming out on the page. Uh, but if you do, oftentimes I, I hear frustration and concern from people who are like, I know this book can be great if I weren't writing it, if someone else would. In fact, they write to me uh, regularly saying, I have this really great idea that I haven't been able to make work. Will you write it? Um, which, uh, which is very flattering. But it's not something that authors do, uh, because we have plenty of our own ideas to write. But um, I think it, it's very similar. And I often use that metaphor that playing jazz trumpet is like learning to write. 
at first you are just, your, your imagination and your ambition is often going to outstrip your skill. Um, and the answer is fundamentals, practicing, writing, being bad at it. Just like if I wanted to really learn how to play uh, a jazz trumpet improv, I could do it by hitting the fundamentals, doing my scales a tad, um, and just spending evenings practicing um, improv, which I wasn't willing to do. And it, there, there is an aspect of improv to writing, if you think yeah. about it. If you, you sit down and you're writing a scene, if you were to write that scene yesterday or tomorrow, it might have some similar things, but yeah. it's going to be, use different wording. You might have different beats. You might come up with different things that are yeah. interesting to frame the story. Um, uh, this is, yeah, this is very common. Uh, I say authors are either, you know, discovery writers or outline writers. But truth is, everyone's a discovery writer. It's just how much, how, how big the gaps are between the points in your, uh, in your outline. Yeah. For some people, there is one point in the outline, and it's the idea that originally starts you, and then they riff on that. For someone like me, there are points that are, you know, much closer together. But even still, when I sit down, it's like I need to include this, this, and this. Now it's an improv session where I try to write a chapter that does that. Yeah, your outline is kind of your uh, chord progression. Mm -hmm. So, do you want to hit us with another uh, another question? Adam? Yeah, um, this one comes from old person in the Ooh. chat. Uh, they say, "Who is Brandon Sanderson?" Who is Brandon Sanderson? Well, Brandon Sanderson is me, <laughs> and so what I define as Brandon Sandersonish is Brandon Sandersonish. Um, <laughs> that is uh, both a nebulous and uh, question that philosophers have spent years trying to turn. Not who is Brandon Sanderson, but who am I? Who is a person? Um, but if you happen to come here randomly, I'm an author of science fiction and fantasy, particularly epic fantasy novels. Um, most known for the Wheel of Time, finishing the Wheel of Time books for Robert Jordan, uh, writing the books Mistborn and the Stormlight Archive. Um, if you want the more amorphous philosophical answer, who is Brandon Sanderson? It is whoever I am at the moment. <laughs> I thought Brandon Sanderson was the pen name of Alcatraz. Schmedry. That's true. No, Brandon Sanderson is a real person that Alcatraz uh, uses oh, on the names right. of his books, so they will get shelved in fantasy to hide from the librarians. Um, Brandon Sanderson is, in some ways, also though a brand name, uh, no pun intended, uh, because <clears throat> when you pick up a Brandon Sanderson book, uh, you can look to the acknowledgments of all the people who had a part in that. Um, and like Isaac has a deep and powerful influence over the whole world of my books when, when he draws a map and puts things on it and is often naming a lot of things um, and stuff like then I use that map and I write and there's Isaac Stewart in the books uh, both figuratively and literally because <laughs> uh, you know uh, he has his standing character um, but um, yeah, like it, it represents my whole team. Brandon Sanderson is me and is at the same time the pen name for my entire team. Uh, I usually, you know, write all of the words. Um, the exception being you have done like uh, the Nikki Savage story um, and the broadsheets and broad um, yeah. stuff like that. Um, Usually the words you're reading are mine, but at the same time, it's often the, the team is going through and Isaac will be like, you know, uh, this happens more often with Christy and Peter, but even you sometimes suggest a change or a tweak or a joke or, and sometimes I just delete that line and put in the better one that you guys added. Uh, it's, it's not uh, probably a huge ton of words, but there are words that Isaac wrote that just end up in the books and things. And so it really is a group effort. Mm -hmm. um, and Peter as well. You yeah, know, he he suggests a lot. He of suggests good a things. lot of uh, of great changes. And Christy now, who's our line editor, mm -hmm. uh, Christy Kugler, um, oftentimes she'll hit a really awkward sentence that I've written. She'll say, "What if you wrote it like this?" And she says, "Maybe." And then colon this, which is what a lot of editors do. It's what Harriet and Moshe would both do. And oftentimes her rewrite is really good. Um, but I mean, I've even had that. Chris, Chris Q, Chris Clue, uh, the football player, right? Who's a beta reader for us sometimes. He's actually a really good line editor. And once in a while in the beta reads, he'll be like, hey, here's a, here's a revision on this sentence. I think this is what you meant. And he's usually right, and I've just put those in. So uh, Chris Clue has written a few sentences of the Stormlight Archive, right? Uh, so am I saying his name right? I think that's how you yeah. say it. Uh, 
So thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Chris. <laughs> uh, very good line editor. So this is kind of getting to that that thing you see in superhero shows yeah. where they're like, who is Batman? Yeah. And there's this lineup, right? And they're all yeah. like, I am Batman. Yeah. I am Spartacus. I am Brandon. <laughs> I am Brandon. And then the real Brandon avoids prison and goes free. That's right. That's right. <laughs> The fake Brandon goes up onto the steps at the end of the stage play and gets executed. <laughs> uh, I guess that's a book first. The stage right. play is only kind of... Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. but, um, yeah. Yeah. Were you... Is that a reference to Les Miserables? Uh, Tale of Two Cities. Ta Tale of Two Cities, yeah. right. So I, I saw today that one of the guys who wrote the musical passed away. Oh, today. Les Mis. Yeah, mm -hmm. Les Mis. Yeah, he was 95. Wow. But uh, what a what a kind of big influence over yeah. um, musicals and things, right? Mm. Musicals kind and of theater cool. and at large. Yeah. yeah. Very, very big influence. I mean, they it's so interesting because I saw Les Mis most recently. In it. I saw it the first time when the traveling show came to Nebraska and it was something unlike anything I'd ever seen, right? Blew my mind, my little teenage mind, um, watching this, this epic unfold on the stage. I had never seen anything like it. And it was interesting seeing it in London two or three years ago um, and thinking, oh, it's so quaint now, <laughs> right? Because set design has become so extravagant, partially because of um, Les Mis, and everything has become bombastic. And, and now Les Mis doesn't feel small, but it feels kind of quaint, almost. And it was strange reconciling the teenage me sitting in that seat and being blown away by the majesty of this thing and the uh, adult me being like, oh, it's Les Mis, look how quaint it is. See, and I saw it in London a few years ago uh, and we were very close and I was really just blown away. Were yeah? I'm, I'm really sad that uh, they're changing the, the stage play. Are like, they? Uh, they're changing the whole Queen's Theater now and huh. it's, they're not going to present it the same way. Uh, last year too. Right? Yeah. yeah. Did, that was... they, they're not losing the rotating. Uh, I have thing. no idea. I just know that they're going to... Well, what I've heard rumor is is that they're going to what the traveling play or okay. the traveling musical usually does. So. Well, when I when I saw the traveling one, it did it um, in the round, so mm. or not in the round. It had the rotating. The, yeah, thing, so. that's how Hamilton is as well. That was is it? yeah, really I still haven't really seen cool. Hamilton. I'm sorry, um, but I've only seen it twice. Yes, <laughs> I I fully intended to see it this year uh, in London because we were going to be in London to see all of the wonderful Brits. Um, which, by the way, we should we should mention, if any of you are in Europe right now thinking about, man, the timing of these is always so rough. I think the next one we're going to do on a Europe ske schedule. Is that right, Adam? Yep, two weeks from today. Two weeks from today. We're going to do it afternoon here. So that, evening. Yeah, early afternoon. So yeah. probably 8, 9 o'clock. I know that's not super early PM, for Europe. Your time. Yeah. But um, better than middle of the night for yeah. you. Yeah. That'll be our uh, our Halloween stream. So. Yeah, so that's the 29th. It's entirely possible that I will come in costume. And I will also be in costume, and I doubt any of you will see it. Mm, we'll have to make <laughs> I, I, Adam appear if you actually come in costume. I need a costume. You need a costume? Okay, I'll hook you up. Um, I think you should go as uh, blue. <laughs> as what? Oh, blue, little blue. Oh, dear. Uh, where are the, the fan mails? Maybe we can should have those... I'm ready to grab. I, I have mean, a quick one that oh, I yeah. can read. Oh, yeah. Go ahead and do... do I got mail. one. Somebody sent me a fan mail. Yay. So Nice. Thank you, Ian, for sending me a fan mail. Is this... How, how much fan mail have you gotten? I This is the first physical one that I know of. Do nice. I get others? Thank yous oh, I've gotten others, Kara says. Yeah. Like oh, that's right. I have gotten some of those. Um, I'm just going to read one paragraph here. First off, I just wanted to say... Thank you for all the fantastic art that you provided for Brandon's books, whether by creating it yourself or coordinating with other great artists. One of my favorite things about sci-fi fantasy writing is the importance that is placed on giving the fans great art, especially as it pertains to the book covers and any maps that are included. And I just wanted to say thank you for noticing the, the, the art. We spend a lot of time on it, and we also agree that it fills out the world. It... Uh, I mean, that's one of the things that got me into fantasy was seeing the maps, seeing the art, and it pulled me into the story. So thank you for enjoying it. Yeah. We, we really like art around here. And so we, we, uh, we spend way more than we need to 
<laughs> on the arts more time and more resources because we really like it. Um, and so we appreciate it when people appreciate the work that we put into it because it is an enormous, enormous job getting a Stormlight book ready. Yeah. Um, uh, more yeah. than a full-time job. Yeah. Isaac will tell yeah. you. Well, yes. I mean, we have all, all of the different artists spending lots of time on it too. And that's, that's a part that, I mean, I know how long it takes, but I'm not there with each artist in the hours and hours that they spend on these things. Mm -hmm. And so, though I bet you'd probably enjoy watching them create I, I it. Would, I would there. Yeah. I would learn things. I know I would. Well, I mean, I think you can, people can still watch Dan Dos Santos paint the Warbreaker cover yeah. on the, on YouTube. I think he's put it on. Um, we should ask him if we can rehost that on our channel in case it's gotten lost or something because we'll look he's it. got a fast forward uh, where you can a watch little time lapse in five minutes. Yeah, time lapse, time lapse of him painting uh, the Warbreaker cover, um, and it's it's mesmerizing to me. Yeah, I don't know if he still sells that video. He had a he had a oh, class he had a, video that he still video. sells, and yeah. it might be on his website still that. You how can, to do it with the time lapse yeah. and longer instructions and things. It's yeah. several hours of instruction, and Dan is a fantastic yeah. teacher. Um, let's do another question. Um, so Sophia from the chat mm -hmm. uh, is hoping that you can give some tips on endings. They've written several endings with different emotional uh, heights, uh, and they just can't decide which one. So okay, any tips uh, on endings? Yeah. Uh, Thanks for the specifics to your specific uh, situation. So... Here's what I recommend in your specific situation is that you get some beta readers to read them and see what and see if you can get people who will write their genuine emotional responses to the beats in your story. P not people who are looking to fix problems. You don't want them to fix problems. You just want them to say how they're feeling at various points. And your job maybe is to get like three different ones for each ending and have them read the end, the book with the ending, and then give them the new, a different ending, and you know, um, swap it. So you've got two different endings. You get three people to read one and three people to read the other, and then swap and give them the different endings. And really, I think that becoming a um, a professional writer, part of the skill is learning how to anticipate how an audience will react, and then learning to learn from reactions that you don't expect. Um, and this is a vital part of my process. It is not a vital part of everyone's process. So I should mention that. There are plenty of people that write books that don't look at it this way. But for me, um, I don't know if, in, if a book is going to land until I've gotten some reads on it, uh, explaining just how people felt about it. And this will help you generate this instinct. Uh, getting this instinct is way more important than getting a fix to one book. Uh, developing yourself a way to judge if a book is doing what you want it to do. Um, I always look for, personally in my endings, paying off promises. So if you haven't watched the lecture that I gave on uh, promises, progress, and payoff, it's in my lecture series from university courses uh, earlier this year. Uh, that would be a lot of help. But the short version is, I think a good story makes promises and then gives you steady progression toward that promise uh, and then has a satisfying resolution, a payoff to that promise that doesn't always do exactly what people are thinking, but gives them an emotionally fulfilling end to that arc. And I am usually looking for my characters to be able to have character arcs and plot arcs that are overlapping and intersecting at various places that are, uh, that are progressing and my endings come when you're getting payoffs for multiples of those various arcs. Okay, uh, Eddie, also from the chat, um, has heard back from his agent with his agent asking for more chapters. Okay. Uh, looking for some general advice on maybe, obviously he should send in more chapters, but yes. is there something else uh, they should do? So, a um, mistake I made early on was that not understanding that requests from agents, as long as they are reputable agents, and I'll get into in a second the di distinction, are a rare thing and uh, are generally something that you want to act upon. For instance, I was sending books to Joshua, who became my agent, 
And he would send me these kind of personalized rejection letters saying, you know, the book would be way better if you did this and this and this and this. Joshua didn't want to say, if you do this and this and this, I will probably pick up this book and represent it. Um, but the subtext that I didn't pick up was Joshua saying, I want to see if you can do a revision, because that's a big part of what a writer has to do. And I want to see how good you are at taking this feedback that I think will make your book better. Um, I just took it as, oh, he didn't like this book, but he gave me a nice rejection. I should send him the next book. And I never made any of those changes. Um, after the fact, he told me, you re Brandon, you really should have tried revising and sending him to me. Um, so when an agent says, I would like to see more, uh, that is a rare occurrence. Uh, rare in that most agents guesstimate like one out of 10, they will like enough to ask uh, for more. So generally, that's something you want to hop on and send immediately um, with requested material in the subject line. Um, and uh, that's a really good sign, so congratulations. Now, a couple of warnings. Warning number one is that uh, to call oneself an agent, all one has to do, as Joshua, my agent, often says, is print off business cards that say you are an agent. Congratulations, you are now an agent. There are professional organizations for agents, but not all the good agents belong to them and some bad agents belong to them. So it is not a 100% uh, way of determining what a good agent is and what is not. And a bad agent is one who's going to be trying to funnel you toward a vanity press. Self-publishing is a viable and uh, powerful part of the market these days. What you want to stay away from for are people who are hiding the fact that they are basically, you don't want to publish anyone who is tricking you into self-publishing. You want to self-publish because that's what you want to do. And if that's what you want to do, it is totally uh, a good idea to pay someone to edit your book. What you don't want to do is send to an agent who uh, pretends to be a really important and powerful agent who then says, you know, your book is almost there. Uh, if you paid my friend, hello, uh, to do this rev these revisions on it, uh, then you would probably get published. That is usually considered a breach of professional ethics. Things might be changing these days as more editors become freelance, but that's a big warning sign. That's a sign of someone who's probably telling every person who sends to them, go get this uh, editing done, and is then getting a kickback from the editor. Uh, an agent who says, you know, um, self-publishing is really exciting right now, and I have this hybrid press that can help you self-publish, and it only costs you $9,000, um, is probably not a good agent. It is probably someone who is making their money by being paid by this publisher to funnel them authors. So be aware of that um, and be aware of the fact that sometimes even good agents can, in my opinion, ask for revisions for too long. If an agent writes back to you and asks for a revision and you make the revision and you're like, wow, this made the book a lot better. I'm, I'm impressed with this agent's eye. That's a really good sign. Um, if you make the revision, you're like, ah, you know, I'm not sure. May, yeah, I think it might be better. You send it to them, they're like, great, make this revision. And then you do that one, and then you send it back, and they're like, great, now make this revision. At some point, the agent's job should be to pick up an imperfect book and let the editor finish doing the re revisions with you because the danger is that an agent gets you to make, start making sideways steps instead of forward steps that... Um, they don't want to represent the book until it's perfect in order to preserve their uh, reputation. Um, and so you revise and revise and you revise and you just never get around to actually selling the book. Uh, so that is a danger with agents also. Um, but if you have a reputable agent, best way to tell if they're reputable is that they themselves or the agency at where they work is consistently releasing books by new authors that you can find on the shelves of any bookstore in the country. Uh, an agent who isn't doing that is an agent that I would, be, uh, I would be wary of. It's okay to have a new agent, an established agency, who's being mentored by somebody. Um, but if they're, not, if they're not able to get your books to the big five publishers, um, then you are better off self-publishing. Uh, and also, when we were talking about musicals, mm -hmm. uh, many people jumped on the idea of Mistborn being the a musical, musical, which is not a surprise. Uh, and one person in particular, uh, Meyer Strauss, 
keeps waiting for me to mention that this was happening in the chat. So okay, it is very there, nice. you, there you are. <laughs> the fact that Spider-Man flopped as a musical makes me more skeptical that Mistborn would make a great musical. There, there is an in-world Mistborn musical. Yes, there is. A telling hero the for all ages. A hero for all ages telling the events of the original trilogy. Yes. <laughs> that, that is not something either Isaac or I came up with. That is all Ben McSweeney. Uh, well, who came up with that and, and wrote it into the broadsheet and said, what do you guys think? And we both thought it was awesome. The, uh, the person who wrote it, though, is my, my in-world name for Brandon. Oh, yeah? <laughs> it's just, it kind of has some, some, uh, it has some uh, similarities to your name, that particular author. My, uh, my in-world uh, Isaac is the royal cartographer Isasik. Is that what we call yeah, you? Yeah, Isasik. Isasik. Yeah. Yep. So he's referenced on, on occasion. Uh, and Kathy from the chat, and yeah, is this, off, she yeah. wants to to have the lead, and the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd want it to succeed, Kathy, not immediately fail. Kathy can be the official cat wrangler for any cats that we need <laughs> she, to appear. She is a great cat lady. Mistborn mm. kitties. Mistborn kitties. Mm. So um, the the previous question that was talking about adding new chapters to the book. I can kind of speak to okay. that uh, a little bit, maybe, and maybe Brandon can fill out Which some of those things. Which one was adding new chapters? So the, the so he, one? the uh, agent, the oh, agent, yeah. he was wondering how to fill out the book if he, the agent's asking for more chapters. Oh, if the I thought yeah. that the agent, this the agent sounds, asked for more chapters. This, asked for more chapters. This, means, yeah. this meant to me they have sent three a sample chapters, and the agent oh, said, that's how "Send we, me the rest of the we, book." Okay. That's we, how we I heard, read it. We heard two different things. Yeah. I was I, I was getting the idea, oh, they'd written something novella length, and they're like... Book wants to be longer. They book wants yeah. to be longer, so... No. Nope. Um, yeah, if, if that's, most of the time that's how I to an agent it. three sample chapters, he's asked for more. Um, now, yeah. if it... Let's go ahead and answer the question you thought it was, because that'll be useful to people. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so uh, what I heard was they wanted... They're like, oh, hey, maybe you should uh, fill out this book a little bit more. Um, and so my, my thought was that you, know, you maybe you, if you've written a novella that needs to be a novel, you're going to lengthen that differently than if you had written a short novel that is missing story beats. Yeah. So one thing would be to, to figure out kind of what the, uh, the archetype of your novel is, look at other books or movies that are like that, and try to figure out what no, uh, story beats you're missing and uh, try to insert that into the correct places without messing up your pacing. It's probably a pacing thing if, in that case. A novella, you would lengthen in different ways into a novel. We should have Eric James Stone on sometime because he's a person I know who is primarily a short story writer who did have, when he published his first novel, that issue that they really liked it but said, this feels really short. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it was like 65,000 words. And so, um, and he's really brief and he had to learn how to fill out a novel uh, as a short story writer, um, he should, we should have him on sometime. He is a wonderful human being. I love Eric. Yep, he is. So the next question from Anthony. Um, will the Rhythm of War release party allow for spoiler questions? Um, we probably won't at the release party. Um, most likely. It depends. What do you think, Adam? You're well, I mean, we've done, we've done it in the past. Yeah. Um, but mean, we've also had an opportunity for more questions at the events in the past. Yeah, I mean, if they're buying Rhythm of War, then maybe we would say yes to spoilers of the first three books. Yeah, and that's that was the specific Yeah, question, the I think actually, books. yes, probably. Like, normally I don't allow it at book signings because book signings are often attended by a person and their family who has not read the book. And so, but maybe here, but we will either way be doing a spoiler full Rhythm of War stream. Yeah, probably like a month or so. Yeah, after, so probably sometime in December, um, where you may ask questions up to and including Rhythm of War and Don Shard um, as spoilery sorts of things. So, um, yeah. So either way, you will get a chance to ask those questions. Yeah, um, and the only way to get questions asked at the release party is to buy the book. Uh, through one of the 10 partnered bookstores that Tor is working with. Yeah. Uh, so you can visit their website. You can visit our website for details on that. But that's the only way to submit questions. Are those questions. sold out? Uh, I think all of them, but uh, the BYU, BYU bookstore. Okay, because they, so they got a big they, stack. Yeah, they yeah. got um, much more than everyone Yeah, how many did they get, Kara? 2,000. 2,000, okay. 
So you can still get in on that uh, for the numbered copies. Is that yeah. Yep. correct? Yeah. All, signed, all of these will be signed and numbered. Signed and numbered, and you can submit questions to the uh, to the release it party. It also has a commemorative stamp, and it'll have our epic bookmark. It'll have a sticker also. Epic bookmark, commemorative stamp, and a commemorative sticker. Is that will that sticker be released other places, or is that like exclusive? Um, as far as I know, they're all coming to the warehouse. They might show up in Christmas. They might show up in Christmas I packages. Asked for a couple extra Sometimes that happens. Um, extra. For those Ouch. who didn't see Don Shard, the novella, novella um, <laughs> is uh, is the third draft has been done is done and is in Christie's hands now, who is our line editor, um, and she and Peter and Karen are working furiously to get. Uh, line edits and things ready for me for the fourth draft next week. And I think uh, your post said it was at 57,000 words. 57,000. How much are you anticipating trimming? I that? usually cut 10%. Okay, so, so 50,000 I would words, guess, basically. yeah. Uh, it probably a little longer because I usually add some as I go as well. So I would, I would guess uh, finished versions like 54,000 would be where where i would guess but i don't know um it bloated a little in the last one so i might cut, end up cutting an, an extra 500 or a thousand words just from the new scenes that i added because they they're a little bit telly um as i was kind of working through some things that needed to be on the in the book so um and christy says that she's halfway through the line edit oh is she's she? in the chat hey, christy <laughs> Um, so yeah, everyone say hi to Christy. Hey, Christy. She's on Facebook. <laughs> mm, on Facebook. Okay, in the Facebook chat. So, um, Christy, thank you. Um, she is, she's come in to help us out because uh, we, we needed a really good line editor um, because um, my editor for many years, Moshe, uh, has retired. Um, and so we needed, uh, we needed, we needed somebody to help out because Moshe is really good at line edits. Um, and so Christy has come on to, to help us with that. So here, here's a, might be a good time for us to uh, show some art that's yeah. related to this. We can, uh, why don't we start with the Don Shard one. It might be called, it's the one, the one on the bottom left, that one right there. So, uh, so we, as Brandon has mentioned, we have some scenes from the Lopin viewpoint mm -hmm. and uh, i'm going to show you the the lopen uh Our chapter, chapter icon. icon we came up for yeah lopen. and I, I don't know if this will wind up in the uh the actual main books but if yeah. we have a lopen chapter we might in the future we might we might so far for lopen we've been using the bridge four the bridge four icon generic bridge four icon because usually what's happening is I have a whole section where we get a bunch of different Bridge 4 viewpoints, mm -hmm. uh, and it makes more sense. But we needed one for, for the low pen. So, so uh, let, let's show that, that icon here. for him. <laughs> All right, so this is the low pen icon, and uh, we, uh, I'm not going to say too much about it because yeah. uh, it's spoilery it's for, a little bit spoilery. for early books. So, But you can see here that we are riffing off of the Bridge 4 icon a little bit. Yep. Um, and... Uh, adding that in there to kind of tie that together. He very much identifies with Bridge Four. Um, so yep. anyway, I'm excited for this. Ben McSweeney um, ha, uh, is the one who came up with this and he did a fantastic job. Yep. I really think it's fun. Um, the other thing that we can, uh, the, the other art that we can uh, mention right now is that we were talking about the release party. Uh huh. And there is a release party pack of swag that is separate from you getting your book from a bookstore. Um, we uh, had created some swag because we thought this was going to be an in-person event. Yeah, we thought we'd have 5,000 people showing yep. up at, and so we had this, and so yeah. instead we're going to be, what, how are we getting it to them? Um, how are we getting that to them, Kara? We're mailing it. We're yeah. mailing it so to you. you. Order it. November 2nd. So November people who have ordered from one of these 10 bookstores will also get this or what? This is separate. This is separate. Yeah. But it's part of the party. So, but who gets it? Oh, they, they, just, they come to the store and buy it. Oh, they come yeah, to the they store, come, they come to and, the buy store and buy it. Okay. So, so this isn't free yeah. stuff. This is stuff this you is can buy if you want. And this yeah, is um, okay. trying to answer questions I've seen online. So you, if you get the book from one of the bookstores, you do get the Epic bookmark, Epic bookmark, you get the, and uh, sticker. the sticker. Okay. And what was the other thing? That was it? Uh, stamp. The sticker, the Epic oh, but and you, you get the, the number, the stamp that has the number in it yes. of your book. And it's signed. 
and it's signed. Sign. Yeah. So um, this is this separate. This is stamp you get to stamp things with yourself. It comes with a it's, stamp. It is in stamped it. in the book. Okay. Yeah. Commemorative um, stamp in the book. Okay. So um, but this is normally separate. at a release party we have like t-shirt or something yes, you can yeah. buy for the release party. That's what you're talking about. T-shirt, lanyard, okay. a bracelet, uh, maybe some stickers, right? Yeah. yeah. And a chicken scout patch. Oh yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I approved this morning, so that's going into print. But um, let's let's show this shirt design. People have been really wanting to see this. is This is something that Kara and her team have been uh, working on, um, and it's done by Haley Lazo. I, okay. I have been pretty hands off on this, but I think it's really cool. Have I seen it? You haven't seen it. Okay. This, this has kind of been going um, going on with. The, I have to go uh, load up the crew. stream <laughs> yeah. to see. We'll we'll uh, we'll I think show Isaac you. Might be able to send you uh, yeah. an email. You should uh, you should. Yeah, send that yeah. to me so I can see it while we're talking about it. Or maybe you can pull it up and show show uh, show Brandon. Great. So Haley Lazo did our art for the uh, the reissues of the Alcatraz books. The interior art. The interior art. Um, she was um, she had done some fan art that was really fantastic. She was in her last year of art school, mm -hmm. I believe, and I saw this. Um, art of Bastille that I just thought nailed Bastille's character and so when we were looking for an artist for the interior illustrations of uh, the Alcatraz reissues she, she was my first choice and um, she did an excellent job with those and she is now doing some things for uh, Kara's team off and on and doing a great job so uh, is that up are no, you ready I to was, put that up? Yeah. So th this is the this uh, is the t-shirt you can get as a commemoration yep. of the of the release of Rhythm of War. Of Rhythm of War, yeah. Which so, would have been sold at the release party, but 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 yeah, we don't have. So one uh, we have we have that, and when we're done showing that off, um, I I have a, an example of the shirt, so you can kind of see oh. what what the shirt. It doesn't okay. have the art on oh, it. Oh, okay. But it is. To show people how cool and nice the the t-shirt okay. is, some people like that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so we have uh, Kaladin and Venli on the shirt. Okay. And uh, underneath it, it says "Strength Before Weakness." Okay. And, um, so the the shirt here is it's a it's a light gray right. color and it's very soft. Right. Not very we like to have these soft uh, soft t-shirts. People seem to like those. I like them. Um, it's gonna be a nice shirt, I think. Did I don't know if that's the exact same one that you just she saw. She just saw okay. me. Yeah. 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 So. I took it from the screen. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So I, I, it's using the colors from the book, which are purple and gold and yeah. Anyway, I think you'll, uh, I think uh, people will like that shirt. Am I in frame? Yeah. Good. Because I just scooted around. You're good. Nice work, team. I didn't even know that was happening. Yeah. It, um, I didn't have enough time. Mm-hmm. Kara's like, I need an artist. I'm like, ask Haley. She's awesome. So Haley's been doing stuff for Kara. And she's been doing some really fun things. Is she doing... What else is she doing for well, this? We're doing a sticker pack, too, Okay. But they'll be full color. Um, okay. Whereas, whereas with t-shirts, you're really limited on colors, how many colors you can do. Mm. And, um, As evidenced by my uh, single yeah. grayscale. Yeah. Um, it is well, awesome, though. Yeah. Pack will be full color. Um, of the characters, and they are turning out really cool. Super. Yeah, we have to pour one out for Taveran Tees, though. Uh, this is a Taveran Tees. Oh, there um, we go. Okay. Um, uh, but they don't make shirts anymore. Right. Um, because, Licensing, yeah. Because the Wheel of Time TV show started, um, and so the license. It is very difficult to keep merchandising of any sort when you sign movie deals. Um, because of George Lucas uh, proving that merchandising is big money, um, we have managed to do it through lots of blood, sweat, and tears, forcing the people that we sign with. But even with them, we basically only get to keep merchandising for us to sell on our store. Um, and so it is, uh, it is rough. Um, I know we also usually write in an exclusion for Badali jewelry because we love Badali. They make really awesome jewelry. They uh, historically had made the first uh, ever licensed one ring. Back in the 70s when he started this, there were all kinds of knockoff one rings for sale. You could buy it you know, at conventions and things. And so he wrote to the Tolkien estate and said, can I actually license this? And they wrote back and they're like, 
you, you want to do it legally? You're the first one ever. Sure, go ahead. Uh, and got him a license. That's how he started his company. And then um, he got to do that all the way up until the movies got made. And then when the movies got made, after years of being a partner, he got dropped um, because of these same sorts of things. And so we write an exclusion out for uh, Badali that they can't, that Badali keeps to, gets to keep making stuff because that was, that was such a heartbreaking story to hear. You know, you, you make the rings, you're the only one who does it legally for like 20 years. And as soon as they get big, then it gets yanked and given to, you know, one of these big um, merchandise makers for movie tie-in stuffs that you get in, like, the Sky Mall and stuff like that. Hmm. So uh, they, they were, were they the, your first license? They were my yeah, first license. I think they were. They, uh, yeah. they came to me because they just loved the books. I didn't think they would sell any, and they're like, well, but we love the books. And so they just did Mistborn um, stuff, like my I think my favorite piece of jewelry ever is still the, just the medallion they did of the uh, of the medals. Yeah. Um, that was uh, that was my keychain for years and years. Now I don't drive anywhere, so I don't really <laughs> have a keychain. Um, yeah. Um, but um, the the keychain I'm using right now that's in my pocket was made by Badali. I mean, so, the same with my just yeah. yeah. Great work, high craftsmanship by people who genuinely love the series. They like do. they didn't come to me to make money. This was when I was nobody. They're just like, we love these books. Can we do some jewelry based on it? And I'm like, I, yes, why? But yes, go ahead. Um, I, they, I, I love that they are fans and they yeah. get the books and they, they do that for all, all their licenses. Yes, they I, do. I, I, but I know that they've, uh, they've had, like I think their Wheel of Time license got taken away also it might have with been. the the television show happening um it did yeah. yeah and i don't know if they still have rothfuss's or not with the the showtime deal um but I'm not sure either but but we have. wrote an exclusion in for badali jewelry and for um uh the crafty games we said you can't cancel their license they make a good rpg and support us for years like people like that we we have to but we have to like write them out each as an exclusion and the lawyers at the movie people all pour over them and fight back and it's like oh come on you really are going to license your own R pen and paper rpg i don't think so just let us do this um so anyway there's a there's a rant you weren't expecting <laughs> welcome to brandon sanderson's rant fest i'm sure people would still watch mm. Uh, any other work, art you want to talk to, or should we break it apart? Oh, we've, we've got another set, but let's do it a different time. Yeah, we yeah. can do it a little later. So it's it's uh, variations on things people have seen mm -hmm. before. Yeah, so they're just if, Kickstarter if, stuff. Yeah, if we get to it, great. If if we get off on a more interesting rant, then then we'll be okay. <laughs> um, Jennifer uh, wants to know if you could talk a little bit about uh, writing Don Shard over the last few weeks. Uh huh. And what what and how you learn to incorporate the beta feedback you got effectively. Um, so learning to incorporate my beta feedback was a long extended process that took a decade to learn. Um, and so how to do it is really hard to explain because this has just been an ongoing process. Uh, it started with, you know, friends of mine who are reading the books and just writing in the margins of the Kinko's printed copy that I gave to them and has evolved to these big kind of spreadsheet things um, where we have both super fans um, and Cosmere experts, uh, casual readers who this is their first beta read ever, and subject experts that we have hired, uh, the subject experts we pay, um, to, that are all kind of giving feedback at the same time, and those are three different types of feedback, right? Like when um, Alice or Lindsay, who are some, several of our longtime kind of uh, Cosmere expert uh, readers who also really know writing, uh, when they give feedback, it's kind of, it's different. Uh, like they know how to give feedback on a book, almost like an alpha reader. Um, and when one of the new people comes along, which we think it's very important that it's, you know, that that we have this because if we aren't getting feedback from casual readers, then 
you know, it'll get way intricate and the things that will lose the casual reader won't get the explanations they deserve, right? Like I have a couple of these in my writing group that the only time they ever read Stormlight books is when I'm submitting them to writing group and they like them, but that's, you know, they'll be like, I have no idea who this person is, Brandon. I'm like, oh, I need to reintroduce this character for the more casual readers. Um, and so their feedback is often different. And one of the things that is difficult to learn to take feedback on is a lot of newer beta readers, um, they don't see that the book is bad right now and uh, that it's going to be better. Uh, a lot of times they're like, I can't believe this is in the book. Why would you put this in the book? This is so terrible, right? And you're like, well, I mean, that's what you're here for. Um, but it's, you have to learn to take off, you're, you're put on your thick skin and uh, not try to fight back. You never, I never post anything on the beta reads. I just read it and try to take the feedback and understand that sometimes when people are frustrated, that's a good thing. And that one's really hard to learn, right? Uh, that sometimes you want people frustrated with a character until because that character is working on something that they need to get over and you need to feel their frustration for themselves, the character's frustration for themselves. And it's really hard when a beta reader is like, I hate this character. Uh, I, I, I want to skip their chapters. And most of the time, if someone says that, that's something you want to change, right? But a lot of the time, someone else loves that character and their arc is really connecting and you don't want to change that character away from the way that it's working from some characters. And then sometimes that's a good frustration that you want the reader to have. And that's a really dangerous one because, you know, you generally don't want your reader frustrated, but sometimes you do. And so it's really um, all has to be balanced by your vision for the project, right? Like even if everybody gives feedback to a book, in a way that disagrees with what I want to do, I will not change that sometimes, right? Even if everybody's against it, I'm like, no, this is, this is my artistic vision. I'm now aware that this is how people react. Um, most of the time you do want to change that, but can you change it by stepping forward instead of just taking a sideways step like I talked about earlier? Taking sideways steps where you make it different but not better, it's a real danger of early revision uh, writing when you aren't quite as experienced. Um, and so this is all really hard to talk about. Uh, with Don Shard, um, what was going on, so there's, there's some big things that I needed to do, and some of them I was aware of, and because the book, basically it was written in July, and we did the beta read in August, and then I'm doing the revisions in September, October, um, it has a really accelerated timeline, which means that the beta read wasn't as clean as I normally like a beta read to do. I really like a beta read to have seen a book after I've done revisions that the alpha read has caught all the big problems. Um, or that I've had time to layer things in. Like there is a whole aspect of this, of this book that I knew needed to be in the book, but I just didn't have the, the time, the brain focus in the first two drafts to put in. And so they all had to read and complain about this thing that I knew I was going to put into the book, but they thought I just completely missed. Um, and so in that case, you know, I had, I had this thing to add in, but still getting their feedback helped me decide how to add it in. In other cases, there were characters that just uh, needed some expanded uh, screen time and stuff. Uh, I can talk about it better during the spoiler stream. Um, but also, you know, I had um, multiple people who are themselves paraplegic read the book that I'd written primarily from the viewpoint of a per paraplegic woman. Um, and they had just a ton of really great information on how to be more authentic to the life experience of someone um, like themselves and also some of the pitfalls that authors fall, uh, often fall into that I hadn't known about. Uh, really handy stuff. And uh, we will be releasing with the Kickstarter because we hit the stretch goal all the different drafts of Don Shard, along with the beta reader document uh, that you'll be able to just read what everyone said and see what I took from that. Um, you can go read like the 3.0 and be like, all right, I read the 2.0, I read the beta read document, now I can read the 3.0 and see how Brandon changed things based on what the beta reader said. 
And I do have a little document I'm writing up of the main things I'm changing and why that will go along with it. Hopefully that sort of thing will be very helpful to you uh, because this is the sort of thing that's really hard to explain because it's an instinct you pick up as a writer over time. Um, on a related note, do you want to tell people about the annotations you're currently uh, I am doing writing? little annotations for the part one of Rhythm of War uh, as the chapters get released by uh, Tor. Um, if you are one of the ones that's waiting to read the book until it's done, until it comes out, I mean, then you can go back and get those annotations. Maybe we'll collate them somehow or maybe some helpful fan will be like, here's a link to all of the different annotations Brandon wrote. They're just little quick things, a couple yeah. paragraphs. They're on Reddit, usually on, or all the time. They're on the thread on Reddit about the chapter for that week. Yeah, so I'd say they're probably, they're pretty easy to locate because they're generally the top yeah. comment on are they? each chapter release. When I the write them, part. they're not because I'm usually a well, day you behind get, yeah, or something. Yeah, you get uploaded so, yeah. uh, pretty quickly. Mm. <laughs> anyway, but I'm sure if that's not the case, someone They will do have a master them. index of all those chapters and the discussion threads on the Stormlight subreddit. The mods there, uh, thumbs up, uh, so that people can go and find them uh, when the book comes out if they want to go read my little goofy annotations. Uh, speaking of people who help, there is a YouTuber uh -huh. who every stream and everything we post goes through and timestamps. Oh yeah, everything you do. So JDB, I think I'm getting that right. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're making yeah. a lot of people's lives easier. Yeah. Uh, we should send that person a book. Yeah. So reach out to if us. If you reach out to Adam, we'll send you a book. We yeah. we appreciate you doing that. A lot of yeah, people just, uh, uh, appreciate that. We'll need proof of who you are. <laughs> yes, proof of who you are, um, and we'll uh, we'll get you a book. You probably have them if you're listening to these streams, but we'll get you a leather bound. I tried to do a little research into him, mm. and I think on YouTube it said he's in South Africa. Mm. I don't know if that's true or not, but either way, let us know. Yep. Um, yeah, thank in you. South Africa, because the shipping is expensive, uh, maybe he doesn't or she doesn't have all of the leather bounds, so we'll get one for them. Um, so, yeah. Um, we also... I think we're going to be doing, when are we starting these? The um, audiobook. Oh, I wasn't sure if we wanted to talk yeah. about that. Um, so for you audiobookers out there mm -hmm. like me, uh, we got approval from Macmillan to start uh, releasing the audio excerpts. So starting tomorrow, uh, we're going to be releasing those, and I'll have a pretty quick release Meaning schedule. They're not just the excerpts, the chapters. The chapters. Well, that... yeah, up through chapter. We're going to catch up to where Tor is, and we're going to go until release day. Yeah. Uh, so, so we'll catch up to where the print edition, the e, the ones on Tor's yeah. website with audiobook ones, very Starting quickly. Starting tomorrow, yeah. and then we will release one a week. Uh, I think we're doing all of part one. Uh, well, it's through chapter nineteen. I think with 19. the way the okay. schedule got. Um, okay. Yeah, so it's through chapter up, 19, chapter wherever 19. that is. So I think we're going to get caught up the week before the book comes out. Okay. So Are you releasing those like two a week, three a week? That's what? almost every day. Every almost every day. day. Okay, every business day there will be Al almost. almost a new hmm. audiobook chapter released on this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, yep. yep. Um, that... They're also going to be putting them on tour.com. Okay, good. Um, so they might have like a SoundCloud with link or something uh, like that. They're probably just going to embed the YouTube embed link. Them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Embed them. Okay, yeah. Embed our YouTube link then yeah. probably? Yeah. Uh, well, just embed the video. Because mm -hmm. um, we we went out and had a cool thing designed to yeah. go with the video so it's not just a static image of the book cover. I hope you guys like it. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a fun little... Cinemagraph kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so look for that tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Awesome. So uh, that's when the pro. That was all gonna... Adam. Good job, Adam. You're very welcome. If you well, guys I... like audiobooks, then you can thank Adam for getting you the preview. Should we uh, do a shout out for Cosmere.es? Yes. Let's do that. On because... Heller, Cosmere.es uh, uh, is the animator, the guy, or I should say yeah, the guy he... who animated the, the, the yeah, cover. It's like a cinemagraph, right? Is yeah. I'm not sure what the technical that, term I'm, is I called, don't either, but... but that sounds right. Yeah. It's, it's, added it's an image a that has image. been kind of, yeah. But uh, they, they have. A I fan. saw it today. It, is, it turned out really well. Yeah, it did. He did a fantastic job. I'm, I'm, you know, our shout out for Cosmere.es. This is our, our Spanish uh, fan site, and they just do a really nice job. It's it's nicely designed, mm -hmm. and um, they're they're great people. And you've got a lot of great fans over um, Spanish speaking fans. And, yeah. Uh, anyway, we appreciate what they're doing to mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to kind of include the the Spanish speaking community yep. there. And we're, uh, we're trying to, to, to support them as best we can. I mean, this should be our first simultaneous release, right? 
in Spanish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and boy, the Spanish publisher has put in a lot of work. They have. To make that happen. And they are oh. so amazing. They are yeah. such nice people. So mm -hmm. good job, Marta. Thumbs up. Um, and team. <laughs> yes, and team. Yeah. Uh, it's the translator we really need to thank because, uh, yeah. It's a lot of work mm -hmm. translating. Yep. Um, our friend Judy Torsak oh, yeah. has a question. Hey, Judy. Um, what inspired you to write the Mistborn series? I was inspired. The, the thing that made me write the Mistborn series, I often point to, there's a lot of different inspirations on, on books, but I was driving to Idaho where my family lives in Idaho Falls, as does Isaac's, as does Ben's, who crashed our stream. <laughs> For some reason, all of my friends are from Idaho Falls, but we didn't meet it until we were in college and were already <laughs> friends and found out, wait, you're from Idaho too? What's up with that? Uh, my parents are both from IF, Idaho Falls. I grew up in Nebraska, but that is where they're from and where they live now. Uh, and I was driving up to see them um, late 90s, early 2000s, somewhere around there and hit a fog bank and was on the freeway and just passed through the fog bank. It was during the day, so it was lit uh, and really thought that the visuals were cool of the fog streaming past my window, almost like it was alive uh, and moving. Hello. Um, and that put the seed in my head of the mists. Yeah, you're gonna talk for us tonight? What do you got? What do you have up there? Oh, it's a piece of the wood. Okay. Not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was the first. Uh, around that time, I also visited the National Cathedral in D.C. And the image of the mist was in my head. And I thought, what if there were like cathedral-like buildings that shined lights through these beautiful stained glass windows into the fog, into the mist, and made the city glow? Um, and I kind of had this idea of it's kind of dark and dreary during the day because of the ash falls and things like that. But at night it becomes colorful and bright because of all of these, these lights and things like that. Um, and I really like that contrast. Um, probably earlier than that, than that was the idea of the story where the Dark Lorded one, um, I'm sure that was earlier because uh, I came up with that while I was reading one of the Harry Potter books like on release day. I'm like, these poor Dark Lords never get a break. And so I wanted to write a book in a world where a Dark Lord had won. And that's, uh, that's the plot inspiration of Mistborn is, uh, you know, the Dark Lord wins and the gang of thieves decides to rip him off um, and uh, rob the Dark Lord. We're going to pull a heist on Voldemort. That's, uh, that was my original pitch to myself. Excellent. Um, James um, mm -hmm. says, as a Pratchett fan, what are your thoughts on the watch trailer? I'm not sure if you've even seen it yet. Uh, let's just... Uh, <laughs> I hope that the, sto the, the show ends up being, uh, being good. Uh, it certainly did not feel like Pratchett to me. Perhaps it's misrepresented, misrep and perhaps it will be a bold vision that will work. Um, I cringed quite a bit. Yeah, because I know you're a fan of adaptation. I am uh, a fan of there's adaptation. But a, there's a point where adaptation stops becoming the correct Yeah, term. and it's a really tough line. And they're even saying it's inspired by, but not. Yeah. They're, not they're not even using based on. Um, and Which I'm sure makes the Pratchett family like, very happy. You just have to... I think that you can do a lot. You can do a lot of things, but you got to nail Vimes. And their Vimes feels like no Vimes I had ever imagined, right? Like, um, so um, I don't want to be down on something before we've actually seen it, right? Um, and art of making a trailer is so different from the art of making a film. Um, and so uh, I don't know. I mean, I... I wish they had just thrown an enormous bucket of money at Neil Gaiman and been like, oh, Good Omens was amazing. Do this, but with, <laughs> you know, the watch. Um, but Neil's got his own things to do, and I, I yeah, doubt... I think he's writing Sandman yeah. right now. Or yeah, yeah, like, but, um, you know, it's, it's too early to tell. Uh, but my initial impression is negative. Um, so... There you go. Um, they, um, from the chat, let mm -hmm. me see if I can see who said it. Uh, can't find it. They want to know uh, who your fa Oh, it's uh, Kalanit. Uh -huh. I'm sure I'm uh, t 
ter terrible pronunciation on that. Uh, they want to know who your favorite Pratchett character is. Uh, my favorite Pratchett character is Moist, uh, <laughs> Moist von Lipwick, I think is how you say it. Um, uh, but I think the best written character is Vimes. Um, and the best, the single best uh, Discworld book is, in my opinion, Nightwatch. Um, and a lot of people, that is, I think it is the best. It's not necessarily my favorite, but I think is technically the best and uh, the strongest novel. I just, you know me, you've read my books. Scoundrel with a Heart of Gold, like <laughs> maybe a Scoundrel with a Heart of Tin, uh, is just <laughs> kind of my jam. And seeing Pratchett do such a good job with that character archetype in a world where he just fit in so perfectly, um, uh, I just absolutely love going postal and the sequels. Uh, Emery says, uh, you talk about getting books into bookstores and the promotion costs, but how does that work when getting books into libraries where the books are free? Yes, so library books is a world that I just do not know a ton about. The publisher has someone at the publisher whose job it is to sell books into libraries. Uh, and you're going to have to ask a librarian about this. Um, and I honestly don't know the specifics um, of how that even works. Um, I know that in the past for like some movies, they would charge a really high amount for the movie to also have the basically the rental rights attached to it for libraries. I don't know if they do that for books. I really should know, but I don't. Um, and I don't know, yeah. Um, I consider libraries to be a good that the publishing industry does um, for the good of humankind, right? Uh, libraries are not a money-making opportunity. Libraries are something that book sales and bookstores supplement our ability to make the books free to those who can't afford or uh, who read too many books to buy them all, um, you know, and are supporting the p authors and, uh, and publishers, but just, you know, need tons of books. I, you know who you are. Um, and generally, um, I just consider libraries a charity that we do and a moral good that the publishing industry can do. And I don't pay a lot of attention to the economics of it, other than to say, I think this is a thing we should do um, for the good of humankind. Um, so. uh, we have a librarian in the chat, okay, yeah. Katie F. She says, Libra library books are not free for the library. Yeah. Um, I thought she had something else, but that's all yeah, she has right I, now. I, I, um, I think, I don't know. I don't know if it's they a buy a copy yeah. at just regular price. I know there are library bindings of some books that they charge more for. The, the, publishers, the publishers worry about the economics of libraries way more than I do, but that might be because they know that if, for some reason, all books became free to everyone, uh, we a lot of authors would probably still be okay by doing things like the leather bounds that we do and stuff like that. Um, so, um, but yeah, uh, I don't know the economic side of it and how they're sold and what they charge and things like that. I'm sorry. Yeah, another librarian says that they just read trade journals and pick from the book selection. Yeah, so maybe I do it's know about the trade journals. Library yeah. selection. Like, I would think that'd be a little bit. I do know that there are things like the journals, like a library like a journal. library journal, where it'll, where it'll give a recommendation whether you should order this book based on the size of your library and the type of collection you have, which I would think is a valuable resource because the librarian can't be an expert in everything. And so I could imagine that librarians are like, whatever library journal recommends for my size of library when it comes to YA dystopian, I will order those books. Um, and things. And I, I know that is a big part of it, the library journal um, and things like that. Uh, and I know the library conventions are a lot of fun. Um, I really like going to those, uh, but I do not know the economic side. Um, Evan uh, says that they're at a stage where they have a lot of several, uh, they have a bunch of ideas, uh -huh. but they work so much that they don't have time to write because they have to sleep. Yep. Um, Maybe Isaac would be a better person yes. for this because he's working so much on your sleep. stuff and you're <laughs> writing your own books when you should be sleeping. <laughs> I see when you write emails. I know. 
So, so what the question is how to, to work How do you find time, time to time. write when you have a full-time job and perhaps family obligations or things like that? So um, I do a lot of my writing in bed <laughs> when I should be sleeping. Um, I, but I, I have this app on my phone called Ulysses that talks to my phone, talks to my computer, and talks to my iPad. And so I can kind of um, outline a book on that. And then I can, uh, if I'm waiting in line somewhere, I can pull it out and I can give it a little bit of thought and maybe type out some notes and work on an outline. But it winds up, uh, I, I still think that it's better to have a, a little bit of uh, time to work on these things than in chunks rather yeah. than, because uh, it is a little bit disjointed and I always have to come back and spend time collating everything and um, organizing it into an actual outline. But that is something that you can do is, is harness a little bit of that time. Another thing is that if you're working and, but you, you might have to give up something else in your life if you binge watch television or play video games, you might have to give that up to find time to work on your book. And the problem is a lot of times that uh, watching, vi uh, playing video games or watching shows is your mental health time yeah, to recuperate true. from a job. And you don't want to drive yourself to insanity through that. Um, Unless you're Kathy. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Kathy, <laughs> Kathy is a really good writer. For those of you who don't know, Kathy, my sister-in-law, who has a, uh, a friendly rivalry with Adam. Friendly? Oh, friend. uh, friend, what? yeah. Um, I've been doing this wrong this whole time. Kathy is an excellent writer. Um, and she is going to be selling books someday when she gets around to actually finishing them. Um, Kathy. Uh, and uh, she, I know, um, has some time she could spend on it. But you don't want to do that, right? Like, you don't yeah. want to dry it. Yeah. Uh, what I've heard from other people... Some recommendations. One thing uh, Dan, um, our friend writer Dan Wells, recommended. Uh, he gave up his lunch hour because lunch hour was not really mental health time for him because he had to get back to work anyway. He took that hour and just shifted to working on stories for that hour. He gave up going out to eat a lot of the days and he sat and wrote um, because he would say when he gets home from work, he's just exhausted, right? Like, it is not a good mental state to be in to, to write books. Another thing to remember is that if you can make a couple hours on a, a weekend, right? You say, I'm gonna, take, I'm gonna take two hours every Saturday and I'm gonna get my uh, loved ones on board, my roommates or whatever uh, on board with, uh, with me taking two hours off and I'm gonna work on my story and all I have to get is 500 words in two hours, uh, which is not very much. But I'm gonna do that to try to just build a habit of writing every week. And uh, it'll take you a number of years to finish a novel at that rate, but you're making progress, you're moving. Uh, and if you have something during the week that you do that is somewhat um, mindless, such as driving to work, uh, is good for a lot of people if you commute. Um, less people are commuting right now, but uh, driving to work, um, gardening, um, doing the dishes. If there are things that you have brain space on that normally maybe you turn on a background TV show or something, instead spending your time during that time going over what you are going to write and just kind of going over, this is the scene I'm doing this week. This is, this is what it's gonna look like. I'll play it through in my head. I'll turn on some music that matches the scene and I'll go through it. And then you go through it four or five times during the week. And then when you sit down to write for those, those two hours, it's totally possible uh, that you will get a thousand words or 1500 words in two hours um, because you are well prepared for that time. And then you make some notes of what the chapter is gonna be next week, what, you, what the scene is gonna be. You keep those with you like Isaac said in your phone or something. And when you have those minutes, you're gonna play through that next scene. And, Think about what's going to make it exciting and interesting um, and try to write that way. Two hours on the weekend um, and hopefully you can find two hours on the weekend. Um, An another possibility is uh, you, you had mentioned commuting and yeah. um, maybe maybe you get really good at dictating. Yeah, that's how Kevin, you mentioned yeah. earlier, writes yeah. all his books is dictating. Them. And it, it's hard. I've tried this and it's a different 
it's different than it's going to come out differently than if you sat yeah. down at your uh, word processor and did this. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you might still have uh, you'll have a rough draft if you send it out to somebody to transcribe. There there are some reasonable places for transcribing, and then you have a rough draft that you can tweak. I know somebody who started taking the train to work instead of driving, even though it took longer because they could write way easier on the train mm -hmm. uh, and got their little laptop and every day on the way to work was that and that's how they found the time. Um, that's how I wrote Clockwalker is oh. and it, it took me, um, I added, it added like three and a half hours to my work day, right? Because wow, I, three and a half? Well, it, wow. was, it was like a two-hour commute there. Oh, and you were out in Magna, and a, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you, that's when you lived way And that was, be, that was before the, uh, the front runner, too. Before and so tracks, yeah. I'd get up at 5.30, mm -hmm. get on the bus, and that was the first, that was what I did after I did some, a bit of reading. I got, I just pulled out my laptop and I wrote. And I was tired. Um, but after a few weeks of doing this, my brain was in the right spot at that time of the day to mm -hmm. work on the book. Just, you know, again... Be careful to take care of yourself yeah. also. Um, it's very, I think, easy to hear about lives like mine where um, I was able to do a whole bunch of things and write all these books um, and think, man, I should be able to do that too. But I was not married, didn't have mm -hmm. kids, uh, and I worked a job that did not require my mental investment. Right? I was a hotel desk clerk, and I am a night owl, and it was overnight, and no one came in. And it turned out to be the perfect job for me. It was a terrible job for you, right? It, it, you it tried was, it. It was uh, really hard because I couldn't stay awake. Yeah. And I, my brain just wasn't on at that time of Isaac night. Isaac is not a late night person. We do magic drafts <laughs> together. And you always want to play Isaac at around 9 or 10 p.m. Because <laughs> he's just talking about how cool the art of the cards are. And he's like, oh, this one. And then. And I lose. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, I would be a terrible uh, general for an army, especially after 10. Yeah. Oh, we got to go pull out the uh, night general. Isaac's, uh, <laughs> he's melting. We'll mm -hmm. get him in the morning. Oh, that's uh, a good idea for a story. Night general. <laughs> there we go. We'll write it down. Yeah. Now you could totally write a story about someone who's, you know, they he's may have the night general come on shift and find out what's <laughs> been happening. And <laughs> that's kind of what Vimes was yeah. uh, in the early books. But uh, regardless. And, um, I, Another thing, too, mm -hmm. is that you talk about taking care of your mental health. Mm -hmm. But another aspect is don't sacrifice uh, the, the health of your family. Yeah. Um, meaning like your relationship with your family. It's, it's, it's not worth it to write a book if you're not going to have a good relationship with your children. Yeah. So. Giving a, but getting the family on board is a good way to do this. Yeah. Right. Um, like saying, all right, every Saturday I take two hours and work on this. And then when I'm done we're going to play video games, right? Mm -hmm. And your job is to, you know, kids, make sure no one comes in and interrupts me so I can have these two hours. It, uh, a friend asked me to ask this. What do yeah. you do if you're addicted to golf? Yeah. And <laughs> you should be writing. I promise that's a friend, not me. Totally, totally a friend. <laughs> addicted to golf. Golf, I think, is good for your mental health. Oh, Adam. no. You your haven't friend's golf mental me. health. Your friend's mental health. You get, you're out, you're Oh, walking. yeah, that's my friend, my friend. Your friend's, your friend's <laughs> mental health. Um, but... Um, uh, I, I would say that maybe driving to and from the golf course every week. Oh yes, is, dictate a book. Is dictate a book. But I'm listening to you're the listening. Book when I do your that. friend is listening yeah, to my dang books. It, I keep, my friend keeps messing me up. Here. Every time I get in your friend's car, my books are on play. Because That's true. Your friend tries to keep very good track of what's happening in the books to be able to answer questions and things when people ask. So. Can you dictate between walking from the ball? Yeah. I don't yeah. hit far enough. That's the, <laughs> I mean, your friend. Aren't you, uh, aren't you yeah. waiting for people? Like, are you slower than people or faster than people? When I play, I'm so slow because I'm <laughs> bad at golfing. That it's always like, oh, play through. And then we... I mean, it all, it all depends on group size. If yeah. I'm by myself, I can do 18 holes in about an hour and a half. Man. Um, if you're in a foursome, that's going to take four hours. Mm -hmm. So it's it really just depends on your group size. Take Jane golfing. Oh, I do as much as and, uh, I can. Tell her you have to, she has to not talk to you so you can write while you're golfing. <laughs> Let her drive and I'll be yeah. on my phone. Uh-huh. That's going to go over real well. It would probably be good for my mental health to not be thinking about golf. Mm. Uh, I, as I tell Jane frequently, I'm never as happy and never as sad as when I'm golfing. You so. had, like, what, what was it last year? You, it was earlier this year. You yeah, I, I hit in the 70s twice this year. Yeah. I've never done that before. 
I don't anticipate doing it again. Hmm. I think it would be incredibly difficult to dictate a book and golf because the temptation would be at... Yeah, you're too busy he's swearing. At, he's at the ninth hole. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he should be able to uh, get this in three, but we're not sure. You know, isn't there a Monty Python skit of that they, they golf announce um, somebody writing a book? Oh, I... I well, I know that there's something that. where they're uh, like golf announcing really weird... Things. They're, I can't they're, they're writing a book, and it's and it, it's like he sits down. He started. Oh, he's I've written a that. T. He's written I an H. Yeah. Oh, he's erasing it. He did decided not to go with the. But it's it's like golf announcers, mm. so they're really kind of quiet and uh, yeah. Uh, we should do the the other artwork. Okay. Um, it's, man, Jello's being so good tonight. So uh, so a lot of this is stuff stuff that you've seen before but now we're on to finals that ha are getting submitted we we have everything submitted to manufacturers now except for the uh the uh the coasters. coasters and the coasters should be out tomorrow yeah. or monday i gave fi one final note on one of the coasters yeah today. i need to make a, a few uh we're, we're basically trying to make the chasm fiend coaster really work as an energy drink um, mm -hmm. logo so uh, we're very, really close on that but uh, let's show you the back of the chowta coaster yeah uh, the colors looked really uh, turned out really nice on this mm -hmm. this is ben mcsweeney doing the uh the art on that and i did some layout with the text mm -hmm. so is that up yeah that's up yeah. i just i like the colors on this it makes me happy it just looks like the sort of thing that you'd get from a taco stand and it, we've translated this over to the chowta stand uh, these are going to be fun. I found a place that does great coasters, uh, front and back, and uh, so we, we hope that we'll be able to make some fun coasters this time around. Uh, let, let's pull up the next thing. Chicken Scout. You haven't seen um, the layout for the Chicken Scout. Uh, yes, that's you. Sticker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. We. Uh, I, uh, Magellan was the inspiration for the colors of the Chicken Scout logo, which is sort of this. 70s fun font with a, a red blue and mm. green colors behind it um this is your fault stream yeah uh everyone else who had does, isn't on the stream is gonna be so confused when they get this we have to have a include a readme file with yeah we the will digital yeah it's some the art this, this is why streams you're getting uh chicken scouts chicken scouts yep uh the patches for the chicken scouts are in we we did this interesting thing where they embroider it a little bit but there's such so much detail in those uh patches and they're the, the size of boy scout merit badges that um it's a combination of being printed and embroidered hmm. so we're gonna see how that that uh works out but uh i think uh, i saw scans of those today they look pretty good um and was there one more thing we wanted to show you the final of the wheel shaper. Yeah. Uh, to... I really like this when I saw it today. I said Isaac needs to show it to you guys. Yeah, so we, we have uh, Venli and um, Eshenai, uh, the stickers here. This is kind of the final. Now, we had mentioned in an update that there was some extra space in between the uh, stickers, and we might be adding extra stickers in there. We wound up not doing that because of the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the the... The bleed on the sides of the yeah, stickers. just the bleeds and the, the different manufacturing things. So all the stickers that we told you we showed originally are there, but we didn't add any extra ones. But um, I think Esh and I and Venley turned out really nice here. The ben did a great job on this. Just really, uh, we were really worried in the original ones and losing uh, Esh and I's eyes. Yeah, some detail was so. yeah. But uh, th those turned out nice. It's been great to have Ben working on these things. He's uh, been a great addition to the team so should we have our chicken do some tricks is it trick time jello do you want to do some tricks you gonna do them all right come on and turn around all right wait till i give you the cue dragon dragon oh now you don't want to do it no that's not the one they all know you can do it dragon good bird Good bird. You can give him a hazelnut today. Mm. You can watch him crack that. We'll get him down and give him some scratches in a minute here. He loves the nuts that he can crack and play with, um, but you can't give him too many of them because that's like a full nut, right? 
uh, where normally when you give a parrot a treat for a trick, you want to give them something kind of small so that you can uh, then cue them for another trick very quickly or you can reinforce. But on stream, he gets full hazelnuts or full almonds, which he will immediately go dunk multiple times in his water. <laughs> So the mechanist had uh, two, or mechanist on the chat, had two mm -hmm. interesting questions. Okay. Uh, the first one being, uh, when he's quoting a character in the book, does he say it's from the character or does he say it's from the author? What's your opinion on that? I uh, prefer the character and then from the book, mm -hmm. uh, personally. Um, I know that, for instance, on Goodreads and various quote sites, they don't always do this. They attribute to the author. But the problem with that is very rarely are my characters a voice for me. Um, they are a voice for themselves, right? And um, like there are things that characters say in the books that I don't agree with. And I wouldn't want you to be going around saying, Brandon Sanderson says all human beings should be subjugated. And authors would be in a yeah. lot of trouble mm -hmm. if that were the case. Uh, and things like that. And so while I appreciate the sentiment, uh, I prefer the annotation that says this character from this book. Um, but okay. that, that little bit of extra context makes yep. huge a huge difference. difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I see a quote and it's like attributed to, uh, say, uh, all Oscar Wilde, right? I never know is that a, a a quip that Oscar Wilde came up with in conversation, which is really cool, or is it a quote from his books, which means it's from one of the characters? Is that different? Um, and it's, it's always one of these things, like some of these, these people who have really strong voices, like Samuel Clemens did and things like that, that you never can tell, is this the character, is this them? I would rather that it, the attribution was always to the character from the book. Um, the next question they had, um, I thought was very interesting. They said, how do you think um, having a direct neural interface, like a neural link, mm -hmm. will affect the future of reading or books? You know, uh, that's going to depend on how these direct neural links um, play out, right? Like, uh, I think the dream and the hope and the fear all at once is that <laughs> what is going to happen is it's going to just replace our sensory information with a virtual world. In which case, I would imagine that, uh, that it's just like an e-reader that just makes the, the, you know, the book appear in your hands or the text float in front of you. Similar right? to like augmented reality. Yeah, kind and of just way. an AR book that floats in your vision. I think I, my honest expectation is that books will not change the, the, the medium of telling books. The reason I say this is um, people have tried a ton uh, in the last years. And granted, we only have about 20 years of experience doing this. So, you know, I could be proven wrong. But what people have tried a lot is this multimedia book experience. Um, where they try to uh, have a book that then there's a link to, you know, a video you're supposed to watch. And these things always come across to the readers as kind of gimmicky and never really take off in the way that the publishers are hoping they will. Um, and what we have found is that in general, people want to, when they're reading a book, just read the book. They don't want to mode shift to playing a game or to doing something else. There is the asterisk here that there are some really interesting projects that just completely bust out of this mold, right? And make it work. Uh, the invention of Hugo, Hugo Cabaret is often mentioned as, and you see some of these, this blending between graphic novel and novel. But I think that form is much closer than like when people are supposed to go watch a link on YouTube in the middle of their book. Even if that book is being read on an e-reader where you can push the button and go to the link, People just don't do it, is what we're finding. Uh, people are not interested in mode shifting like that. Uh, I will point out 1770-76 that I, uh, I mentioned on one of my annotations lately as a really cool um, multimedia storytelling experience um, on SB Nation um, that, is, that is totally breaking this and works, works really well. Uh, it's one of the ones I've read that I'm like, this is, this is absolutely proving that it is possible to do a multimedia experience um, with text. But even in that, I just like reading the text. And all the other stuff is like fun additions, but the text is what's holding me there. I think there will be new 
types of stories and media that come about that didn't exist before that will do all of these things. I don't think the book will change um, I, any more than the book stopped existing when television and radio dramas, first radio dramas and television, new mediums were formed that could learn some lessons from traditional book uh, narratives, but um, had to find their own way in storytelling. And it's entirely possible that some of these will become way more popular than books. I mean, books already are probably the least popular form of entertainment, uh, of mass entertainment. Um, and that's okay, right? Like, I'm, I'm not worried about that. I, I think books are just going to keep going. One of the reasons is they are a single artist's vision, which has some weight to it. In most cases, even though we have this all of this group, and my books are a whole group working together, you've got, I'm doing, you know, 99% of the text that's in this book. Um, and I have a vision for the story I want to tell, which comes with, you know, problems and foibles, like the best uh, movies and television shows, um, I think, have a collaboration between a lot of creative minds that can do things a book can't because you get this collaboration. But I think there's something to be said for the singular artist vision that someone can sit down and write a book. And um, yeah, you can still sit down and write a video game, but a, the video games in general have moved beyond one person being able to do that in most mass media. Your uh, concerned apes notwithstanding, uh, he made Stardew Valley. Um, mm. I believe that's who, who uh, made yeah. it. Sorry if I got his name wrong. So it's still possible to sit down and make a game all by yourself, but uh, you know there, there are very few Toby Foxes out there able to make a game all on their own, and I think most of it's a big collaboration. Movies and television shows, obviously big collaboration. YouTube's opened a cool area of people who make things with small teams again um, for a visual medium, but you can see that YouTube is like a different art form from most movies and films, right? It's like they came up with something different and made it work for the medium. I think that's what will happen. And I think books will generally stay as books. What I can't say is how popular books will be compared to other media forms. Kind of the, the f almost philosophical question here is that how much do you change the art form of a book before it's not a book anymore? Right. And it, it you know, it, it because people read books and they're like, oh, I want that as a movie or something yep. like that. And, and there's this in between, these in between steps of graphic novels and screenplays mm -hmm. and then movie. Um, it's almost like you see a movie, if, if books didn't exist and you saw a movie and you said, you know, I, I, I like the movie, but you know, it would be interesting if I could carry it with me if phones didn't exist. And then somebody writes it down, right, in a certain way. And is it a movie anymore or is it now a book? Um, and so there's. Yeah, I mean, how much do you change it and it's no longer a book? Yeah, what is 1770, 1770, 76? Uh, yeah, and some people are saying there's a sequel. Wondering there is. He's, yeah, he's writing it right now. Or something like um, it's not finished yet, and I want to wait till it's finished. Uh, some uh, people are saying it, it's you can find it in secret places. Yeah, you can find the ending. The well, oh. that, that's all I know. I, okay. I, the, the, just go in without any spoilers if you can. Uh, I mean, I'll give a strong language warning, not a content warning, but there are, you know, there are some curse words in it. So, uh, and someone in the YouTube chat linked yeah. to it. If yeah. You are uh, go into it blind. Uh, expect, expect something weird and be open to something really different and an art form that is not, wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago. Uh, and it is fantastic. I loved it. Ooh, wow. 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 Good job, man. He actually flew around the room today. Some He's getting pretty good. Yeah. Do you need some scratches? No, you need. You can't have my buttons. Look, you can't have my buttons. You can't have my buttons. I know you want them. You can't have them. <laughs> you can't have them. And he's on your microphone right now. Just... He's on the mic. Oh, right. Thanks. You're welcome. You can get scratches, but you can't eat my buttons. Oh, you just want to have the buttons. Here's... What's that? Oh, we'll see. We'll see if he wants. If he actually wants scratches or. Uh, or if he is just too hyper. I'm guessing he's gonna go for the microphone again. He might go for the microphone again. That's totally possible. Yeah. I had visions now, of him on wants, a... He wants me to scratch him. On a skateboard with his wings doing that and mm -hmm. pulling the skateboard along because that's basically what he just did mm -hmm. with that. Now this is, this is when he's with a lot of people. He doesn't want to get down and be scratched. He wants to be up here 
on me. Oh, hold it. There, you, you little stinker. Oh, I'm gonna turn yes. that down. Turn that up, down. Oh, he got it, and it's oh, only a five hundred dollar microphone. <laughs> Jello. No. Clip. Oh, is it the clip? The right clip there that yeah. fell. Yeah, I got it out of his mouth. Let me get the clip. Get the clip. <laughs> we have to hide the microphone from you. I can't get them, so they go under your shirt. Yeah, we might have to get the under the shirt ones. <clears throat> huh. Do you need me to come? No, I got. It. Okay, I got it. Yeah, yeah, I know. We took away all the toys, all the toys, all the toys that you wanted. You're a very good bird, though. Here. You're being good tonight. Sorry, people probably can't even hear what I'm saying. Oh, they can probably hear kind what you're saying on these microphones. Here. Uh, but let's get this back on. Um, so, yeah, it's the, the microphone is the problem, Jello. If you could, uh, <coughs> yes, hello? <laughs> A little bit farther down, Brandon. About okay. 10 inches from your mouth. Up there? Yeah. Um, use the force. Good bird. Good bird. There you go. Go back and play over there. Do not eat my microphones or my buttons. Yeah. I don't know. I don't... <clears throat> Maybe we should just have me take the microphone off when Jello decides to come visit. Um, how's it going? Can you guys hear me? Uh, you should be good now. Okay. Yeah. Let, uh, let us know if we need to turn them up a little bit. I didn't want to blow anybody's ears out. Yeah. Good job on that, Adam. We had a uh, we had an attack of the uh, the chromatic chicken. <laughs> um, he did not get the button off. He tried. He tried very hard. Has he ever uh, eaten one right off? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. My uh, my authorial jacket with the uh, the, oh, the uh, things the right on stream. Yeah. He just snapped one off. He got it so <laughs> fast. Then he went back up on his post, chewing on it, and felt very proud of himself. Dip it in water. But no, he likes to do the take his head down and get scratched so he can still keep an eye on everything. Mm. Um, when there's nobody around, he will just put his head down and be scratched in kind of a more natural position. But when he wants to keep an eye on everybody, we have to. The biggest problem with Jello right now is he was really good with strangers before the pandemic, and he would let people scratch him and give him treats and things like that. And now it's been six months of only seeing his immediate flock, my family. And now strangers, he's like, I, I don't know what to think about those people. If they come close, I am going to try to take a finger off. So we're gonna have to do some work with him on that. Trying to get him to accept his harness again. He decided he didn't like it, so I've kind of gone back to square one on harness trading. Yes. So one of the questions that just came in from the chat from just a jazz pian uh, pianist uh -huh. says, if we miss the Leatherbound Kickstarter, when do we get a chance to get the Leatherbound Way of Kings? And I thought Isaac would be a great person to talk well, about Well, we actually don't know yet. We don't. Yep. We're, uh, in fact, we, we're going to discuss a few of the th yeah. these things a little bit later, but uh, there, there is going to be a chance. Yeah. So there yeah. will be a chance to buy from bookstores editions that have at least some of the Kickstarter goodies packaged with them. Um, did we decide just random one order or did you just get extra wind runners or uh, you um, know? It's going to be what we have. What we have. Yeah. yeah. So we, we, we have uh, ordered enough to fulfill what people have asked for. Uh -huh. um, and, then, and then we've ordered a little bit extra of each order with a little heavier on wind runners because that was the most popular. Right. So we will have boxes that we don't know which swag will be in there, and we don't know when those will be available at the booksellers. One of the things we have to be very cognizant of is we don't want people to we don't want people to be offering books for sale to people when other people haven't gotten their books, right? Like um, that's uh, that seems like it would be so just after our Kickstarter fulfillment. Yeah, is done. basically we we have to decide when it's going to be and things like that, um, but. Um, we will probably, this is really early, so don't take too much on it. We will probably have them for not this Christmas, but next Christmas, uh, in the store, um, uh, reordered and things. But, you know, it's going to take me to get through these 15,000 for the Kickstarter people, get their books in their hands, and then me signing books, uh, pages extra for us to well, sell in the like store. 25,000? I thought it was 15,000 just for the Wave Kings Prime. Well, no, no, there, there were, we did 10,000 early. Oh, right? I, I see what you're And saying. so we have 15,000 more. Total. Yeah, yeah, total of around 25,000. I think we may have ordered 20,000 more 
um, right? Yeah, so it might be 5,000. Yeah. I might be signing some of those Total now. Or? In, in process is around 28,000. 28,000. Yeah. So, um, but basically, uh, we have to wait, and we will keep you up to date on that. Mm -hmm. um, it's seven, almost 750. Should Great. we do a couple Let's more Let's finish questions? this or stack. Okay. Ooh, can I yeah. talk about this? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Go ahead, Isaac. Okay. I just wanted to say, everybody, thank you for backing my Kickstarter for Monsters Don't Wear Underpants. Um, it uh, funded in less than 24 hours, and uh, um, I was humbled by the response. I, I didn't know what to expect, and uh, we're going to have a real book. Here's, uh, here's the uh, thing that many of you have seen before, the prototype. And I just want to mention a couple of stretch goals that we have. We are not focusing on money stretch goals. I have enough money to do a, a printing of the book, and I'd like to be able to print a few extras to uh, go in local Barnes and Nobles and things like that. Um, and so the two stretch goals that we have going on are uh, we're trying to get to 600 backers. Um, and right now we are almost to 500, and we have 15 days to get 100 more people. And what everybody will get if we get to 600 backers is um, this is a book that's not going to win any awards, I don't think. And so we're going to make an award sticker kind of for it. <laughs> um, it's going to be a gold sticker that has a pair of underpants on it uh, embossed into it. And it says, warning, this book contains underpants uh, that you can put on the book or just have the sticker to, to put on other people's books. Put it over the top of a Caldecott winner book if you want. Um, but uh, there will be a, a, a gold embossed sticker, and I think that would be fun if we could reach that goal. So that's at 600 backers. And we have another one, which is um, 5,000 views of the video. And there's a little, uh, a, a little gauge that's at the top of the story to show us how close we are to that. Right now, we're in between three and 4,000 views, closer to 4,000. Um, and just uh, send your friends to, mon to monsterunderpants.com. And you can watch the video. They can watch the video. All they have to do is watch the video, and we get another video view. Uh, one of the exciting things about that is that Michael Kramer and Kate Redding did the uh, audio narration for this, and they did a fantastic job. And it's I think it's fun to uh, watch. What yeah. were you going to say, Adam? Uh, there is a link to the Kickstarter in the description of the video. So wow. Thanks, Adam. You're very welcome. Yep. And also should be our, the address if people want to send fan mail, either to me or to Isaac or to Adam. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> In, uh, tips on how to improve your golf swing fan art of uh of uh of uh adam defeating kathy and various important uh events and things they should really send me books on how to give up golf <laughs> uh, how, to, how to give up on your dreams if you have any good books on how to give up on your dreams that's the that's the one i need uh, let's do a question and then i'll do a maybe a fan mail right at the end or something how many of these do we have Three? Yeah, I should get one of these. So give us a question, and then this one isn't... Oh, it is open. Okay, so we'll do that fan mail, whatever that fan mail is. So this one comes from Ryan in 2D. Okay. Uh, they say, I'm a full-time self-published fantasy writer. Excellent. Congratulations. Awesome. Well done. Uh, but would eventually like to write a series in trade. Uh-huh. Do you think having an established brand could work against me? No. My experience is... I, you ask that in a vague enough way, yes, it could. I could imagine scenarios, right? In most cases, no. Um, there, the prejudice against self-publishing is mostly vanished. I'm sure there are still some who have it, uh, people who are not paying attention to the market. Um, but um, I would say that having an established readership and brand is generally seen as proof of concept to traditionally pub traditional publishing and as um, a way to kind of just have a boost to a book. Um, and it puts you in a really good position because you do not have to take a deal from New York unless it is a better deal than you already have for yourself. Um, so having an established brand and things, uh, I would say upside, um, almost complete upside. and. Um, being able to leverage that into a um, a deal, like for instance, I do know you know of people who have managed to get print-only deals or print and audio deals 
uh, with trade, uh, the Big Five, and well, they weren't the Big Five. They were like the rung right un underneath the Big Five. I don't know if anyone has done it with the Big Five, but uh, a rung right underneath that still gets your books into all bookstores, uh, like you know we did with Tachyon, that got the Emperor's Soul into all the Barnes and Nobles and things, and you keep the ebook rights, so you have the best of both worlds. Uh, you do not have to take a deal. You can walk, and most one of the things about traditionally published authors throughout most of history is you were so excited to get published. Uh, ev my agent has talked about it. every other author's like this that you want to bend over backwards and not jinx it to get your book published because that's been a goal for you for so long. Or my agent will often say you need to push even a little harder than you think so that you can make a career out of it. Right? We want to be have eyes toward the career. But new authors just want to get published, and you don't ever have to worry about that. You have proof that you can do it, that you can make a living as a writer, and you don't need them. So at that point, you should be asking, what can you do for me? And if you have something that you think has b broad mass appeal, that, uh, that getting out there to a lot more people is worth giving up the larger share that you get, um, then uh, give it a try. Um, but yeah, I would, I would not say that's ever um, a hindrance. The only time it could be potentially a hindrance is if, um, like, if you were an academic publishing and you didn't want people finding your uh, dinosaur erotica under the same name or something, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> that sort of thing that, but m in most cases, having an established brand and well-known is just going to be all upside in my opinion. So uh, go forward. Good job. Congratulations on, uh, on achieving so much. And I think it puts you in a really nice position. All right. Uh, going to read um, this fan mail. Uh, dear Brandon, Adam, Mom, etc. I have to I tell my it. mother. I made it, everyone. <laughs> this is from Bob. Um, Thank you, Bob. Brandon, I'm curious what your thoughts are on C.S. Lewis. Um, so I really like reading C.S. Lewis books. Um, I don't wish to emulate him in the didactic nature of his storytelling. I think there is a g good place for that. I think he did a very good job with it. Um, but it's not the type of storytelling I want to do. And I often uh, uh, hold up George Orwell as one of my favorite prose writers, the type of prose I like, but he was also very didactic. And that's not the sort of storytelling that I generally like to do. So while I've read a lot of C.S. Lewis and impressed by him, it's not my style. Are you a fan of the Narnia books or his other work? Uh, I've read the Narnia books and really like them. I really like the screw tape letters. Um, I have not read the science fiction series, which I probably should at some point. I am wondering if it is possible for a person to take the power of a shard and then later decide the whole God thing isn't working out. Can they retire and go back to being a person or are they immediately sent to the beyond? Uh, it is possible um, that they could retire as a person. Um, wouldn't be the first thing that would happen, um, but oh, there's a, there's a Sazy in there, which is good because we usually send something to them. Uh, it may or may not have uh, bite marks on it um, <laughs> from my bird. Um, but yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, I appreciate that. I'll look through the rest of that later. Um, but I uh, appreciate you guys sending in uh, the fan mail and asking the questions via analog. Uh, writing styles. Uh, it's always fun to open those up and answer the questions that way. So uh, we are basically done. Uh, and he lasted the whole time without freaking out too much, uh, even though it's getting past his bedtime here soon. So yeah, I am talking about you. Um, can they even see him when he's mm -hmm. up there like that? Uh, uh, right there they can. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. We will be back in two weeks, but our next stream will be uh, earlier in the day uh, so in uh, stateside, it's going to be early afternoon, uh, and in Europe, 8 or 9 or something like that uh, p.m., and potentially with costumes. Potentially, there will be multiples of us in costume. And none of them will be dinosaur erotica. None of them will be dinosaur erotica. The, no dinosaur erotica. Someone uh, called you Brandosaurus Rex. Brandosaurus Rex. <laughs> um, I, am, I have started doing just a little bit of facial hair. I'll see what I'll have in two weeks. Uh, because some scrub is appropriate for the costume I'm doing. <laughs> Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. See you later.